Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for braving the cold, and actually, it's beautiful outside. Um, thanks for coming tonight. It's a, a rare opportunity, and we're grateful for it. Uh, I'm Marshall Norman. I'm minister here at Unity of Madison. Um, and again, I welcome you. We have a promotional exchange going with WORT. We want to give thanks for uh, their help on promoting this event. And so I just wanted to, uh, uh, as a part of that exchange, promote some of their events that they have coming up. Uh, the first one is the Fair Trade Holiday Festival. That's Saturday, uh, tomorrow, December 4th, at Monona Terrace from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, all sorts of, looks like, handcraft item, items for the holidays, uh, bags and clothing and jewelry and so forth. A uh, benefit for independent media, the Haymarket Books, the Socialist Worker, uh, dot org, uh, Tani Diakiti and the Desert Trance Infusion, uh, Solace, Paper Umbrellas. This is all at High Noon Saloon uh, this coming Monday, December 6th uh, at 8 p.m. Again, that's uh, a benefit for the independent media. And then finally, uh, it's WORT's 35th birthday. You've probably been hearing that announced around town quite a bit. Uh, tomorrow, again, at High Noon Saloon, uh, between the hours of 5 and 9 p.m., uh, the Back Porsche Radio Broadcasting Incorporated celebration of the 35th uh, birthday for WORT, which is a great occasion, 35 years in Madison. Uh, and so. Again, welcome, uh, thank you for being here, and I'm gonna invite up now Nick Cozy, who's, uh, oh, I just, yeah. These little uh, slips that you find on your uh, chairs are invitations for you to hook up with us if you feel so moved. Uh, fill them out and leave them on your chair. Um, and let's see, something else too, I was, oh yeah, oh, these stuffed animals that you see there, I'm just gonna explain those. Those are being donated by people uh, they're for you to, you know, put on your lap, keep you warm, fill them full of good energy. Uh, they're going to be distributed through the Dane County Parent Council to kids uh, for the holidays. So uh, that's the idea behind those. Uh, bathrooms are in the lobby. And we, our apologies, we're right in the middle of a um, building program here, uh, actually making our building accessible to everyone uh, through the installation of an elevator. So uh, we have different entrances that, that, than we're used to, but it uh, looks like we all made it, and so good for you. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm going to invite Nick Cozy up. He's a professor at the UW Medical School, and he will uh, introduce our speaker. Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, uh, thanks. It's a real uh, honor for me to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Roberts, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, from Northern Illinois University. Um, I've known uh, Tom for over 25 years, and we met uh, when I was a student at the School of Pharmacy in Madison. I had an interest in, in psychedelic drugs, and especially their pharmacology, how they worked, and how they worked on cells and receptors and so on. And it was difficult at the time, and it still is, to find uh, uh, people who are interested in these substances uh, professionally. Uh, a lot of my friends uh, were, you know, in tie-dye and uh, Grateful Dead concerts and so on. But uh, to find a, a, per a person who is actually a professor, uh, which uh, Dr. Roberts uh, uh, was, and he, he had the first uh, catalog-listed class uh, on psychedelic drugs at a university, and uh, I wanted to find out more. And well, where is he teaching? Well, it's in DeKalb. I was like, what DeKalb? Are you kidding me? Uh, and so, uh, uh, long story short, we met and uh, formed a friendship and, and relationship. And I actually, uh, have, he's given me the opportunity to uh, go uh, teach in his class. Uh, uh, usually once a year or so. Uh, Tom has uh, received his PhD from Stanford University. Uh, he's uh, uh, written uh, several books, uh, Psychedelic Sacramentals, uh, Psychedelic Horizons, and most recently has edited uh, with Mike Winkleman uh, the book uh, Psychedelic Medicine, which looks at some of the newer uh, research uh, using psychedelic agents uh, for uh, 
to, to treat human diseases. And uh, really, uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Tom Roberts. Am I on now? Yeah. Good. I mean, on this way. Um, I want to thank Unity for inviting, us to, uh, inviting me to Madison. Everybody has their favorite thing to talk about, and psychedelics, particularly in religion, is mine. So it's a delight to be able to come here. And I want to share, thank WORT. When I was driving out this morning, um, I was listening to the radio stations from DeKalb and Rockford, and they faded out. So I just clicked up a little bit, and I came onto a, this odd radio station that a guy was doing sort of a satire of the night before Christmas. And it was WORT I found out when they announced themselves. So it looks like a really interesting radio station. And um, I also want to uh, thank um, UTV. Is that the right? WIOU. WIOU, OK, TV, um, who are taping this. And they eventually will um, put it online and perhaps on YouTube. And especially Shakti Bookstore, who started the ball rolling on all those, this. Um, they brought some of my books that are on the back table there if you want to take a uh, look at the psychoactive sacramentals. It's not psychoactive sacraments, it's psychoactive sacramentals. Um, and that's because our introductory writer was an uh, order of St. Benedict, and in Catholic Church there are sacraments and sacramentals and you have to be very careful not to call a sacramental a sacrament there are seven sacraments, and sacramentals are little things that help out, like crossing yourself and so forth. So this is the psychoactive sacramentals. <clears throat> the, the talk I'm giving tonight um, is online. Uh, rather, a, a text version of it is online. And also, the slides are available. So if you see a reference, let's say, to this one, like from Journal of Psychopharmacology, and uh, you don't have time to write it down or can't read it, um, it's at a, a <coughs> online location called NIU, as in Northern Illinois University, dot academia dot edu slash Thomas Roberts. And there are two or three other slideshows and three or four other articles there. So if you want to have an article version of this or actually see the slides to look at the references, that's where you can find them. OK, let, let me start with this interesting study that came out of Johns Hopkins. Actually, in 2006, they originally published it, and this was a 14-month follow-up. And they asked the people who were volunteers, the volunteers were um, given uh, psilocybin in, uh, individually with uh, two counselors in a nice, cozy room that felt like a living room. And in follow one of the follow-ups, they asked them, you know, what, if they experienced something that seemed like a significant, meaningful experience for them, would they please describe it? And these are some of the comments that they came out. And the question I'm wondering is, if these thoughts and feelings can be generated by an event in a chemical lab, what would it mean to humanity if a large number of people, even a significant number, like 5 or 10%, felt, for example, that the understanding the understanding that in the eyes of God, all people were equally important and equally loved. And what would it mean for humanity to adopt that? Or if everybody felt freedom from every conceivable thing, including time, space, relationship, self, it was as if the embodied, quote, me, experienced ultimate transcendence, even of myself. Or a non-self self held suspended in an almost tactile field of light. So instead of having to consider these things in a philosophy course or reading mystics from just centuries ago or even thousands of years ago, what would happen if we could provide people with these experiences? How would individuals change and how would society change? So that's really the question that I'm spending my time looking at. So whereas there are a lot of people who are doing actual research on the medical and psychotherapeutic use of, of psychedelics, I ask myself, if you put all these things together, what does it say about humanity, about the human mind, and about society? So if anybody wants to write to me and say, I want to be a volunteer in your experiment, I have to say, sorry, I'm not doing the experiments. I get about one a week of those. So um, That's where we're going with this, is to look at some of the implications. And tonight, we'll look at the implications um, for religion.
Okay. And what I'm going to suggest, actually claim, although I'm, probably, I'm not 100% sure, is that we're going into a new era in religion. And I want to combine some of this information that's around to talk about what this new era is and where it's coming from. <clears throat> the position I'm taking is that if we go far enough back in religion or deep enough into religion, we come to something called mystical experiences. It's important not to misunderstand that word mystical. As it's used in TV, for example, it means sort of any weird stuff like uh, zombies from the Bermuda Triangle invade New York City, as TV guide would say. It's a mystical you know, show. Well, in the psychology of religion, mystical has a much more determined uh, experience, determined description, and we'll talk about this. And this is the general position that religious mystics take. There are mystical uh, trends in all the major religions. And one of the arguments people sometimes say is that they form sort of a basic root from which the religious tree grows, or the religions, beliefs, organizations. And others that say that, well, they may be different experiences, but that our vocabulary is so poor, we have to sort of think of them as being the same. But this is from, um, as you can see, Christianity and world religions. And the authors say that isn't religion, after all, before it is doctrine and morality, rights and institutions. And we're going to pick up each one of these, doctrines, morality, rights and institutions, religious experience. And isn't religious experience in its highest form mystical experience? So one of the things that psychedelics can do, and this is always a can do, sometimes happens, it isn't always happens. People have mystical experiences, and they think more like those two examples that were at the beginning of the first slide. I teach a class, as Nick mentioned, uh, called um, um, Psychedelic Studies. And um, I've been trying to remember the characteristics of a mystical experience, so I challenge them to come up with a mnemonic device um, that would help me remember this. And a woman in my class came up with pot, mu pot music, which is very easy to remember. It's not always to remember what all the things stand for. But these are the major characteristics and descriptors, descriptions of mystical experience. There is, by the way, a standard, uh, something called an M scale, or mysticism scale, where people can self-report their mystical experiences. And all the current research on mystical experiences uses that. It's uh, by uh, Ralph Hood. So the first one is paradoxicality, and that's that opposites seem not too much to be in conflict, but it's part of a larger whole, and the meaningfulness often can just, I was saying, well, I wish we could do this with Congress, that opposite, if, they could, if opposites could, should be able to enrich each other. Objectivity is the sense of knowing. It's called a, also a noetic characteristic. And there's a sense of, oh, this is really true. I'm having an important insight here. And this is a, uh, one of the major characteristics of a mystical experience. Uh, transcendence of the self means that here I am being Tom Roberts, but on a psychedelic experience, I can sort of take off my Tom Robertsness and put it to the side. And much to my surprise, there's something left. So that's ego transcendence or self transcendence. And you can take off your identity and put it to the side just the way you take off a shirt or a coat and put it to the side. Transience which means it doesn't last very long. There are a few people apparently who are able to maintain themselves in a mystical state, but not many. Mood changes. Um, this is a, often for many people the most positive experience that they've ever had. And this is a, a common descriptor of it. Better than orgasm, or better than a good meal, or better than, better than, better than. Unity is a sense that when I put myself to the side, I may feel or identify with all of humanity, with the whole cosmos, or perhaps with a piece of music or a beautiful painting. So the sense of, of unity expands to be not just me as everything inside my skin plus my hair, but me plus. And the plus may vary from time to time. A sense of sacredness, this is very interesting because it seems that the sacredness we often attribute to a, a text or a church or a painting or something like that, this suggests that sense of sacredness is generated within and then we then project it off on whatever it is that we're looking at. So this, uh, this also makes sacredness an experimental variable. We'll talk more about that. Ineffability, I love this one, is the inability to say things in words. So people have a mystical experience 
They say there are no words to describe it, and then they write a 500-page book about the mystical experience, <laughs> full of words. But of course, it's mostly po as poetry. It's like this, but it's not like that, and so forth. And change in behavior, we'll look at this in more detail. And the people tend, but again, it's a tendency, it's not always, to leave their motivations of what's in it for me into how do I serve humanity or how do I serve the cosmos or how do I serve God. So the, these are the major ways. Now, not, this is a, an ideal example of a mystical experience. And not every mystical experience meets all these criteria. But this would be a perfect example of an ideal mystical experience. So here's a little definition of mysticism that it means um, possibility of divine union, of union with the divine nature by means of ecstatic contemplation. That's the OED's version of it. And I've also added, and by other means, including in entheogens. And we'll talk a bit about what an entheogen is. This is the main theme that we're going to be looking at tonight. And we'll come back to this slide three or four times. Um, there's a handout on the table next to the door that has this and some other uh, um, diagrams and, an else, and uh, another handout right next to it that sort of summarizes the talk. The main idea is that at the basis of, of uh, religious experiences are something called the primary religious experience or PRE. And it goes by a lot of different names. Uh, a state of unity of consciousness is probably the least loaded, but there are all kinds of possible names. And according to the mystical view of religion, um, people who have this experience are likely to, it's likely to affect their beliefs, and the beliefs in religion from a mystical perspective answer the, or ask the question, um, what was that? What does it mean? And so people having these experiences then want to understand the experience. The second is that rituals tend to recreate or celebrate or commemorate the primary religious experience. And um, we'll see several examples of this. Now, organized churches tend to get away from this. And um, this will come back a little later. Ethics, I just mentioned people want to express the sense of oneness or love and gratitude and social, react social responsibility and social action. And organization that then a church, a synagogue, whatever, tends to houses the beliefs, the rituals, and the ethics. But after a while, the organization tends to take over and spend less attention to a primary religious experience and more attention to the sort of the organizational structural aspects of religion. Uh, this is a, a book by uh, Karen Armstrong, a uh, former nun. I think she was a Franciscan or maybe a Dominican. She's talking about the transition that happened about 500 years ago. And she's pointing out, let me just read this one, instead of trying to get beyond language, Protestants would be encouraged to focus on the precise, original, and supposedly unchanging word of God in print. Before around 1,500 years ago, very few people could read. This included priests. Um, with the development of the movable type and the printing press, text became available generally to people in general. And this democratized religious text. And from that, we have the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, the large last 500 years development of Western civilization, when the relationship to God changed from doing rituals and rites and being a member of a church, in most cases a Catholic church, where one would go to church, participate in mass, observe feast days and saints days, but basically did stuff. That was religion. It was a religion of ritual and rite. With the, the predominance of the written word, we're now in a period in which and religion is understood cognitively. That is, if we ask somebody that his or her religion, we expect to, we are saying, what do you believe? And a belief is a cognitive verbal thing. Or if we, we may ask, what religious text do you read? What do you read? They will talk about religious text. Or if they want to justify a particular belief or a behavior, they will refer back to the text. It goes back to words all the time. So we're in a very long, powerful 500 years in which words have basically taken over religion rather than ritual. Now, we still have rituals. We still have rites. But just like the snowstorm that's due tonight, the, word, the blizzard of words is sort of covered over the rituals and rites. 
and we're in this, in this word period. Now, what I'm suggesting is we may be moving through a new transition that will democratize primary religious experience just as the printed text democratized access to sacred text or to, the, to words. Um, this is a, a, the best summary of research on psychedelics. Unfortunately, it came out in 1972 and is still the best summary. Um, but uh, Brinspoon and Bacalar, summarizing all the re research to date on psychedelics, said it should not be necessary to supply any more proof that psychedelic drugs produce experiences that those who undergo them regard as religious in the fullest sense. Now we get to what an entheogen is. Entheogen means N or within. Theo, of course, is God or the divinity and generating. So it's a psychoactive plant or chemical or prayer or meditation or breathing technique or yoga or lots of other things that generate the experience of God within. So the, the ones we're looking at tonight largely have to do with, with psychoactive um, chemicals. And so we're going to be talking about a psychoactive plant or chemical used in a religious context and or providing a feeling of sacredness. The reason I have that is a great many people take psychedelics for non-religious or spiritual purposes and have a mystical experience and it turns out to have been a, a religious, spiritual, sacred experience. So the intent is helpful but not necessary. A feeling of sacredness and the ones we're talking about largely are LSD, peyote, ayahuasca and psilocybin. So this is what we're talking about tonight is do entheogens democratize primary religious experience just as the printed text democratize access to sacred texts. And here we are back in our theme slide and to look at how some of the beliefs are influenced by psychedelics. Um, Stanislav Grof who is the world's leading psychotherapist uh, with LSD, talks about people who have had levels of getting in touch with actually their birth experience and deeper than the birth experience, and that they all become interested in the spiritual dimensions of life. He um, was studying originally and working originally in Czechoslovakia and then came to this um, country, and he mentions Marxist philosophers, so, suddenly become interested in a spiritual search after they confronted these levels in themselves. So that was a, a, a spiritual conversion rather than, a, I think, a religious conversion. Now this is a description of um, a woman who had a mystical experience uh, when it was legal um, in a, a place in the Palo Alto or Menlo Park, California, and she describes this in a paragraph. Now I've broken her paragraph up into these bulletin items with the idea that one could take these items and make a, a quiz, uh, a survey out of them, like, you know, a Likert scale where the, my experience was very much like this, my experience was not at all like this, and you can mark points along the way. Or I agree with this statement, I disagree with this statement, and you can mark it along the way. So her, her descriptions of what she realized with psychedelics, in this case LSD, could be easily broken down into a, a research instrument and it's also important as a subjective experience of how this very well-educated woman who had studied Western uh, religions, well, world religions, had her insight enriched when she did psychedelics. So she said, the perennial philosophy and the esoteric teaching of all time suddenly made sense. So the question would be, yes, very much like my experience, not at all like my experience or somewhere along the way. I understood why spiritual seekers were instructed to look within. The unconscious was revealed to be not just a useful concept, but an infinite reservoir of creative potential. I felt I had been afforded a glimpse into the nature of reality and the human potential within that reality. This is a nice full dis dis description of a uh, mystical experience. Together with a direct experience of being myself, free of illusory identification, and constrictions of consciousness, my understanding of mystical teaching, both Eastern and Western, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, 
and Sufi alike took a quantum leap. I became aware of all great religions and understood for the first time the meaning of ecstatic states. Uh, Dr. Vaughn was one, the, the second president of the Association for Transpersonal Psychology. She's a clinical psychologist uh, in uh, Marin County. I think she's retired by now and has written books on spiritual development and intuition. And it's largely her fortunate, fortunately subscribing or becoming a member of research that was done in Menlo Park that sort of opened her doors of perception to this area. Let me just mention briefly an, uh, an excellent book. If any of you are cognitive psychologists, this is the book to read. If I were teaching a course in cognitive psychology to graduate students, a special seminar in, in um, psychedelics or even different mind-body states, this is the book I'd have them read, Antipodes of the Mind. It's written by Benny Shannon, who's a professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He went on a vacation to Brazil got interested in ayahuasca, ayahuasca, has been back lots of times. And what he does in this is to um, pick out the implications of ayahuasca, which is the, a psychoactive tea made in Brazil, for cognitive psychology, and the implications of cognitive psychology for studying different mind-body states. So this is one of those wonderful books that brings together two different academic fields to enrich each other. Um, now, this separately is, is one of his personal uh, results on this. If I were to pick one single effect of ayahuasca that had the most important impact on my life, I would say that before my encounter with the brew, I was an atheist. And when I returned back home, after my long journey in South America, I no longer was one. <coughs> I think this is a wonderful chance for evangelical churches, but I just don't see them grabbing it. <laughs> you know? Here we are back to our main slide again, and we'll look at how primary religious experiences show up or, or, or influence um, rituals. Again, what we're looking here is a switch in ritual from communal practice, such as going to mass or some other church um, observation, to individual reading, that is, each person is responsible for reading the Bible. This, by the way, is the origin of uh, public education. Everyone should learn to read, and the original reading behind that was everybody should, be, should learn to read so that they can read the Bible. And the public schools and public education has come out of that, that historical root, among others. And then finally, are, are, we, are we in the transition period of moving toward primary religious experience as being the stuff of religion? So we, we might not ask, what ritual do you perform, or what text do you read, but what experiences do you have? And we see this not only in psychedelics, but in a number of different ways that are emerging in our culture. So there are a lot of ways of producing mind, body, spiritual uh, practices. And um, entheogens are just one. Some others are yoga, contemplative prayer, Meditation, fasting, isolation, chanting, breathing techniques, vision quests, and so forth. And again, none of these produces the, quote, desired result all the time. But if you're lucky, it does. And the things you can do to make it more likely that one would have a mystical experience or less likely if you want to go in that direction. This is the um, Marsh Chapel at Boston University. Um, this is the location of what was, is known as the Good Friday Experiment. And in this experiment, um, Walter Pankey got a, uh, used it as a dissertation for religious studies. He already was an, was an MD and a psychiatrist. And what he did is to give uh, psilocybin to 10 students from a theological seminary. 10 also received an active placebo. Uh, they, they were in the basement of the church during the Good Friday service. And the loudspeaker system brought down the, um, the service from upstairs. And um, afterwards, he had them both describe their experience and do a version of the mysticism scale to see whether this would invoke a mystical experience. Now, of course, these being seminarians were primed to have a mystical experience. So their effect would not need to be generalizable to the whole population. And um, he did the amazing thing about this 
is that um, Rick Doblin, who is the president of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Study, and there's a folder back there, they're the best way to keep up on current research um, in psychedelics. Uh, did a 25-year follow-up, and uh, there were only um, 20 original people in the study. He could, couldn't contact all of them, but from those that he did contact, they continued to see the experience as um, the most meaningful psycho uh, religious psychological experience of their lives. Um, they also, more of them remained in being clergy than those who dropped out of being a cler clergyman. Those who had had the psychedelics were the, the ones who stayed. And also, they continued to develop an interest in religious experience in addition to sort of text and ordinary church behaviors. Now this is, this is probably the, the singular experiment in the social sciences because it's a group of people who had one treatment once. It lasted for 26 years and in fact when they retook the mysticism scale the scores were higher. So it uh, seemed to affect their behavior between the time they originally were in the experiment and the time that the follow-up took place. And so that one experience once with this restricted population had an effect that not only lasted 25 years, but intensified over 25 years. Now, I don't know of any other experience in the social sciences that, that has that. This is a, a, an astounding experience. Now, this is what was somewhat repeated in the Johns Hopkins study that the, the quotations came from. And this is, a, um, this is from the original Johns Hopkins study where the volunteers were given psilocybin in those nice living room type rooms. 33% <clears throat> of the volunteers rated the psilocybin experience as being the single most spiritually significant experience in his or her life. Now this is um, doing a questionnaire uh, several days to a couple weeks after the experience. With an additional 38% rating it as being among the top five spiritually significant experiences. So basically put these together and we've got about two thirds of the people rated the experience as the most or one of the five most important spiritual experiences in their life. Now look what this does to religious studies. Religious studies now can become an experimental study. You can do experiments to see if people can experience sacredness and meaningfulness now, how you interpret that is a, a really wild sort of thing to think about. Maybe we can talk about that later. But because people experience it, how do you interpret that, that experience? That's the hard question. The easy question is having the experience. And, the experience, and having the experience is not that easy. So around 1500, this is that quotation from Karen Armstrong, which notes the transition from church ritual to printed word. And I've uh, sort of bastardized it by saying the success that the reformers would do in large part to the availability of entheogens, she said, printing press, which not only helped propagate new ideas, yeah, that holds, but also change people's relationship to text, and I'd say to text and to ritual. Um, I highly recommend this 20-minute um, online um, video. Roland Griffiths, the main researcher at the Johns Hopkins Studies, was um, asked to talk at the, one of the TED series. And um, I use this in my class, about the second or third class meeting. He does a beautiful presentation of what the study studied, how they studied it, and the fascinating effects on meaningfulness and significance. They're doing additional studies now at Johns Hopkins. The interesting thing, um, uh, one is on uh, nicotine addiction, and one is on uh, meaningfulness and significance uh, dose-related responses. And I think they may be looking for, they may be open some more studies there. Here we are on our theme slide, and we'll take a look at ethics. And this is the path that I propose for another path of moral development. When we think of moral development, usually people say, well, pe children lose their moral, 
learn their moral development from their family, from the school, from churches, from society, from, you know, basically the social experience. And um, almost all research on moral development takes that particular perspective and looks at how one or another will affect children's uh, moral thoughts and or behaviors. But if one puts oneself to the side, motivation changes. It's no longer become so much what's going to happen to me, but what are my resp responsibilities to others. So there are a number of, of events that can um, trigger these transpersonal experience. Transpersonal, as m many of you know, an area of psychology, it means just be beyond the personal. So when you put that identity to the side and there's something left, transpersonal psychology studies that's something that's left. Um, so there are a lot of examples. Meditation, contemplation, psychedelics, brainwave trading, grace, and so forth. These arrows are sometimes but not always arrows. So people who've had transpersonal experiences sometimes but not always have primary religious experiences. And um, we've talked about those already. They sometimes but not always move to what Abraham Maslow called the being values. Things like truth, love, agape, beauty, compassion. Values that don't have to do with what do I get out of it, but how do I relate to others in a larger sense. And often but not always, this example changes of life work they take humane service, charity, and reorient their lives, not so much to what do I get out of it, but how do I serve others? And there's some very interesting research that came out on this. This is a, from a psychology of religion text. It does not refer particularly to psychedelics. It's from uh, Wolf's Psychology of Religion. Among the predictable experiences of mystic characteristics, of mystical experiences are a sense of the sacredness of all life and a desire to establish a new, more harmonious relationship with nature and with other human beings. Imagine if more people felt this. There is a corresponding renunciation of the various forms of self-seeking, including the ethos of manipulation and control. So this is about people who've had mystical experiences all different ways and not particularly the psychedelic way. So we see mystical experiences have this effect. And the question we'll come to in a bit is do mystical experiences from psychedelics have this effect? This is a very readable, fun book called Quantum Change. William Miller is or was a psychiatrist who specialized in alcoholics. And one day one of his patients came in and said, Dr. Miller, I had the most amazing experience and describe the sense that we would call a mystical experience, but the patient had no vocabulary to discuss it at all. And, and he said, and I've stopped drinking. Well, you know, the psychiatrist, psychiatrist said, good, keep it up, you know, good. But it was really kind of puzzled about this experience. It doesn't fit in with the usual view of human nature. But the patient got better, so that's good. And the next week, another patient came in and said the same thing. So this got him wondering, now what is going on here? So he put an ad in the newspaper for people who had this type of experience, please to contact him. And um, he, some were just sort of crazy people, and some had what seemed to be fairly grounded people who had these experiences. So he decided to collect all these instances together and find out what do they have in common, what do they feel like, how do they affect people. Now again, these are, these are spontaneously occurring mystical experiences. They're not as a result of drugs, or the people are not particularly doing this type of prayer or meditation. Um, um, Aldous Huxley calls this gratuitous grace, where you're just walking along and suddenly zap, you have a mystical experience and you're really lucky. Or you've been awfully good and God has said, ding. <laughs> so this is the book they looked at, and they looked, of course, at people's change of motivation. Now, um, they list actually 50 values, and these are the top five. And it's important to recognize that this is not a before and after survey, but this is a survey that came from having the people who had these experiences look back and answer the question, what were your motivations before this experience, and what are your motivations now? So that's the before after in this. You could do an experiment in this, and we can do now a new type of experiment in moral development. I don't think many institutional review boards are going to approve of this with children or even adults, but it's there and somebody will be doing it eventually. So 
He has two columns for men and women. And before, for men, the primary motivations were wealth, adventure, achievement, pleasure, and to be respected. And afterwards, spirituality, by the way, was way, way down on the list for the before. And after, spirituality, personal peace, family, God's will, and honesty. And for women, the high ones were after were growth, self-esteem, spirituality, happiness, and generosity. So there'd be an interesting question of why are these different and why are they the same? What counts for the difference? What counts for the sameness? So there's some nice research for somebody to do. Uh, I'll, I'm going to uh, skip this. This is a statement from Stan Groff, um, who mentions that people who, well, I won't uh, mess it either. He says, the, among the most frequent consequences of the psycho-spiritual transformation that accompanies responsible work with ordinary states of consciousness, okay, is ecological awareness, and um, a, 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 he mentions earlier in this, a awareness of how one's actions do and should affect society. So what do we find with psychedelic users? This is a, a study um, done in uh, Israel and Australia. And the researchers were looking at how different groups scored on three different instruments. One, a life values inventory, an emotional empathic tendency scale, and a sense of coherence. Um, there were three groups, people who used psychedelics, people who used other illegal drugs, and non-users. So there we got three groups compared here. Um, in the life values inventory, the psychedelic group was highest in spirituality, concern for others, and concern for the environment. In emotional empathic tendency scale, the psychedelic people were tied with the other illegals for empathy. And sense of coherence scale, um, the psychedelics were tied with the non-users, um, and they were the high ones in there. So again, this is not an experimental before treatment after study, but a survey of how groups who use different types of drugs probably are getting something very different from them. And one of the differences in psychedelics is often people who are after a, a spiritual experience. Here we are back to the fourth part of our theme, and we'll look at various organizations that have to do with um, the use of psychedelics. This is a tricycle, the, Bo the Buddhist journal. They had a survey several years ago and asking the question, questions about the relationship between psychedelics and Buddhism. Um, this is the issue that published it. Um, in the, of the survey, and non-Buddhists could take the survey too, it was online, anybody could take it. 89% um, had engaged in Buddhist practice 83% had taken psychedelics, almost all of Buddhist practice. 40% said their interest in Buddhism was sparked by psychedelics. Now, people are wondering, why are, what are people finding on the, quote, Eastern religions? Okay, a sense of transcendence is sort of built in and is up front on Hinduism and Buddhism and, and, and Zen. So people who are interested in self-transcendence, looking around, are not likely to see those paths in Judaism or Christianity, but they're there. But unfortunately, they get sort of they get pushed to the background all too often. Um, Fifty-nine percent said psychedism, psychedelics and Buddhism's, Buddhism's do mix, and forty-one percent do not mix. But seventy-one percent said psychedelics are not a path, but they can provide a glimpse of the reality to which Buddhist practice points. So this is sort of like a, a trailer for a movie. They say, okay. You've seen it now, do the practice, and eventually you'll be able to have these experiences and become a better person yourself. This is a nice book called Zigzag Zen. I love the title. And uh, the, um, it's a, a collection of interviews, and between each chapter are some very nice artwork. My favorite psychoactive tea. So 
we see a lot of the interest in, in Buddhism. This, by the way, was a largely American, not entirely, but largely American sample. And if you talk to people who are active in Buddhism, some of them won't want to talk about it at first, but they say, well, you know, I had this odd experience. And you know, that's kind of a clue. Um, and you start talking about the experience. A lot of them got interested in parts of their mind that are not available in the ordinary awake or dream state of consciousness. And psychedelics open the door, and then they say, well, I'm not going to do it in psychedelics. I'll do it with you know, meditation or prayer or yoga or breathing techniques and so <laughs> forth. The best known one, of course, is the Native American church uh, use of peyote. And this was written by Houston Smith. We'll see another one of his books in a bit. And um, thanks to some almost universal collection of churches, after um, two Native Americans uh, could not collect unemployment insurance because they had been fired for using peyote, um, they it caused such an uproar in the religious community um, in the 1980s and early 90s that um, pressure was put on Congress and they passed two laws, the Restoration of American Freedom, of Religious Freedom Act, and one particularly for the Native American Church that made it the government's responsibility to show it had an overwhelming interest in, in prohibiting the use of psychoactive, or prohibiting any religious practice, including psychoactive drugs. And this is the story of Houston Smith. If you've taken a comparative religion course, chances are you used Smith's book, um, Religions of the World, originally called Religions of Mankind. And he is like the person for comparative religion. And he wrote this with the Native American, um, Reuben Snake. The hot area now is ayahuasca, the tea coming from Brazil. I just chose this book out of you know dozens of books that are out there about ayahuasca. And um, it's, it's getting hot in the judicial system now. There have been a couple cases on ayahuasca. We'll talk about those in just a minute, in which the churches have, uh, have won. Here they are. The Unión de Vegetal is a Brazilian church, a syncretic um, Christian church. Um, they had a, uh, a church in Arizona or New Mexico which shipped in this ayahuasca tea. A customs intercepted it and um, uh, would not release it because it, it contained DMT, which is a, a restricted psychoactive drug. And they sued customs to get their tea back. And they went to a, a three-judge local panel, uh, two to one in favor of the church. The Drug Enforcement Administration appealed, and there was a bench of the, the bench, that, the Denver bench, which is all the judges in the area, and they, char they voted in charge in favor of the church. So the DA appealed it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. The, the Supreme Court heard it and um, voted eight to nothing in favor of returning the decision to the district court. And when you get a return decision, eight to nothing, they're pretty well telling you, you guys really screwed it up. Okay, so there we have a Supreme Court uh, on it. The Santo Daime, uh, a church, in, uh, is another ayahuasca church in uh, Oregon, and um, they sued to be able to use um, ayahuasca as a sacrament. Um, the local ch church uh, didn't allow it. Um, Nick was one of the expert witnesses on it, and he can fill you in on the details and where that is since then. But um, so far, the church has been winning in this case. Is it, is it finalized and they've, do you know? Yeah, they, uh, they uh, finalized it. Uh, they finalized and the church can't use it? Yeah. Yeah, good. So the, a really rich area that's coming up is um, freedom of religion um, and drug policy. These areas are really challenging each other. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this. <laughs> Anybody want to go to law school and get in a nice hot area, this would be an area to get into. <coughs> Finally, uh, there's a handout of this on the back table. I didn't bring enough, uh, sorry, but um, this is a, a sort of summary. And that's that it looks at this type of transition that's happened from, from the Gutenberg's period. I've chosen um, Gordon Wasson, who was the man who uh, really started looking at the possibility of psychoactive mushrooms being a source of religion. So this is a picture of Gutenberg sort of representing the transition that happened 500 years ago in Wasson. It could be others too, the, our current transition. Um, 
The icon, of course, is the Gutenberg Bible, and I've chosen the Amanita muscaria mushroom. It could be any one of a number of different chemicals, but pretty mushrooms are nicer than a, a, a drawing of a, of a molecule. What democ democratized was the printed word and now primary religious experience. The route to spiritual knowledge switches from reading, study, thought, another, a cognitive process, um, to mystical experience, unit of consciousness. Spiritual knowledge currently is belief, dogma, doctrine, creed, ideology. Th see, these are all verbal stuff. We're, we're, so, we're really into this verbal age. I don't want to get rid of the verbal age. I just don't want it to be the, whole, the only thing. And instead, um, we would get um, unmediated direct perception, that sacredness and meaningfulness that the Johns Hopkins volunteers experienced. The main academic disciplines are now theology and philosophy, and I think biology and psychology should take their place um, and are taking their place. The ethical action and values, it's the, the do's and don'ts, and here we get into the transpersonal beyond self values, the type of things that um, Miller's people ran into and that the psychedelic group ran into in the comparative study. And finally, education, religious education, is now largely the reading and interpretation and understanding of texts. And I think it would go into experiencing self-transcendence. So this is the movement then that I think is taking place from sacred rites to sacred text to sacred experiences. And these are some good um, books on this. Houston Smith, the world-renowned philosopher of religion, has written a book called Cleansing the Doors of Perception, which is about his experience uh, with uh, psychedelics and his interpretation of them. Higher Wisdom is a book that I use in my class. Uh, these are the authors. It's an anthology. And the, most of the main um, elders in the field have written about what psychedelics have meant to them um, over their lives. And these are people with 30, 40, and 50 years experience with psychedelics. So they thought about this a great deal. In Theogens and the Future of Religion, another anthology that Robert Forty put together, it was um, published by the Council on Spiritual Practices. This is uh, my book, Psychoactive Sacramentals, which is a collection of people who attended a conference that I organized. Um, the Chicago Theological Seminary and the Council on Spiritual Practices co-sponsored the meeting. And we asked the people there to write uh, essays that, we be, that would be included in the book after the meetings, after they had, you know, had a chance to interact and talk with everybody else. So this is technically not a proceedings, although one or two of the articles, like Smith's article, is basically his, his uh, presentation there. The Road to Eleusis, Gordon Wasson, the image that I showed you on that comparative slide, has looked at the question of what was the role of mushrooms in the origin of religions. I think he overmakes the case by saying it was the origin religion. I think it is likely to be a contributing um, a tributary. And this, uh, in this, he and the authors claim that the ancient Greek religion at Eleusis was, um, they served some sort of uh, sacrament that seemed important to people. And he uh, speculates that it was ergot, um, a, a psychedelic fungus. It has to be treated. You just can't eat it off the plant. Apples of Apollo is lots of fun. Um, if you buy this book, read the footnotes. Um, Ruck is a scholar of uh, ancient Greek language and botany of the ancient Mideast. And he claims that a lot of Greek literature that we just see as interesting plays and myths and stories actually have to do with, uh, with uh, psychedelic mushrooms. At some point, I think he he overinterprets the information. But basically, from what I know about the field, and I'm not at all an expert, I think he's really on to something. There's a nice chapter in there called Jesus the Drug Man. <laughs> Cosmic Game by um, Stan Groff. Um, Groff 
the world's expert on psychedelic psychotherapy, has asked himself what does all the sessions that he has led and had himself indicate about the cosmic existence and what is real out there. Um, and this is the book where he answers that question. And uh, this is the, the final uh, slide. Um, a manuscript uh, that I've written and these slides are, are available at this location. So if you don't want to, if you didn't get to jot down any names or references or something, this is the place to look. NIU, as in Northern Illinois University, academia.edu, then Thomas Roberts. Okay, thanks for letting me talk about my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> any questions, comments? No free samples? <laughs> thanks, Thomas. Thank you very much.